Um, and I will just stress that while well, Kate and I come with our official labels, English Heritage and Surrey County Council, and also Fines Group, we are both experienced, like fairly experienced, got a fair few years between us, um, assessment writers, post excavation specialist fines, um, environmental uh, writers. When we may well end up being slightly lightweight comedy duo, but we'll see how we go. Okay, so most of this is really coming from our own experiences. So what we feel uh, we've learned from writing assessments, what we feel we could probably do better, I think. And we're referring to um, various sources of literature and surveys as well, but it, it's very much from our own personal experiences rather than our official um, titles, I think. Okay, lots of words, don't worry too much. Um, these are some quotes about what a specialist assessment should be, and I've colour co uh, color coded them really to reflect the three what I see is the three aspects of assessments and the three important things we're, we're doing. Um, we have a statement from the Algeo advice note for post excavation assessment, of which states that an assessment quanti quantifies recovered data and evidence from all stages of work at a site, describing its range, character, and date. This is the cataloguing stage, and it's really important, and I think we can't go on without that. We then have a couple of quotes about research potential, and I particularly want to mention the second one there. The value of the archaeological material for research, educational use beyond, sorry, the, an assessment will assess the value of the archaeological material for research slash educational use beyond the terms of the project design should also be, be noted. I think this is actually something that's really worth considering. It makes the assessment process probably more interesting. It's not necessarily got a cost implication, it's merely putting it out there that actually you can do more with this material beyond the original research design. Um, the quote before that also mentions uh, WSI project design, we've heard quite a lot about that already. And then the last two um, are referring to the costing and time um, implications, so we need to use an assessment we need to figure out how much time it's going to cost and how much financial cost is involved in doing the full analysis. Okay, which I'm not going to talk about in particular detail, but I just want to really stress that these three things, so three aspects of an assessment. First of all, we're cataloguing, we're usually feeding information into a relational database of some sort, and ideally that would start on site so that we, when we get the material, we know how it relates to the features to the archaeology and um, you know, what we're going to add. We're also adding research value. We're looking at the research value in terms of answering your WSI questions, but also what potential there is for further research beyond the cost of the original project. And we're also essentially um, coming up with some costings and we're creating a sales pitch. So whether that's a fixed sum of money and we're competing with the other specialists for money within the budget or whether we're trying to gain more money. You know, got to, we've got to provide some value for money. We've got to convince the people funding that it's worth funding us. And worth funding the work. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then on to Kate. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, um, so looking at how we actually go about doing the assessments, this slide um, is actually prepared by Ruth and taken from the Environmental Guidelines, the Animal Bone and Archaeology. And when I first looked at it, I was like, mm, I don't like that terminology. But actually, it's different words. We're saying the same thing. We're all, all specialists are basically trying to do the same thing. Um, one thing I would point out is the um, contextual integrity and chronology. I've been writing post-ex assessments for 20 years now and three weeks ago I still had to ask because I still do some freelance work as well as um, my job at Surrey I had to ask somebody to send me the context data um, and I find it quite depressing that I'm having to stand here and still say that it, we all know it should happen and specialists should be given this information but we're still not always provided with it and it's not just the context information you know we we want to know more we want to know if there are any sampling strategies on site um, if there's any selection discard going on on site, you know, all that information we need to know, particularly if we're coming to these projects much later on, if we're not involved um, early on in the project. And one of the things that came out of a recent project funded by Historic England and working with the Finds Group, um, snazzily entitled um, The Review of Standard of Reporting of Archaeological Artifacts in England, otherwise affectionately known to us as Project 7090, 
did pull out anecdotally from development control officers that when they look at the WSIs, quite often you'll have sometimes quite detailed environmental sampling um, strategies within the WSI, but very rarely are artefacts mentioned in any detail in the artefact recovery, um, presumably because environmental sampling priorities, um, they're inevitably included because they do require active decision making on site, whereas it's a kind of given, you'd hope, that the collection of finds, it, it's kind of more passive and occurs regardless. Um, However, for us, knowing what collection and discard policies we used, particularly the bulk finds, it does help inform us when we come to do the assessments. Which one is it? Is it that one? Oh, yeah. Down, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've heard quite a bit about flexible approaches so far today. Um, and as Cassie was saying earlier, um, flexibility and the fact that there is no one size fits all and I had to include her because it's the first time, first day away from her for two years. So <laughs> she's in there with her big hand. Um, yeah, there, uh, there isn't one size fits all. And um, the specialists, uh, you know, uh, Algeo identified that in their advice note that specialists, most specialists recognise that we have to be flexible in our approaches. And through discussions with other specialists, it's clear that the recording and cataloguing stage of assessment is the most variable and flexible and the approach adopted will vary according to the type of specialist material, the nature and the scope of the project, the size of the assemblage, the research questions being asked. But the aim in all cases, from our point of view, is to be able to identify potential and importantly to avoid repetition in the processes further down the line. So if we look specifically at ceramics, um, Sadly, that's not from Surrey, but I like it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I've been, writing, I've been writing assessment reports for 20 years. I've worked for large commercial units. I've worked um, as a freelancer, um, and I work for a county unit. So I've experienced a range of approaches, organisational approaches. And I'm not going to go through the specifics of how we do pottery assessments. As a ceramicist, I'm fortunate that um, we do have comprehensive guidelines published uh, most recently, a little plug for the standard of, of pottery studies in archaeology that was produced by the three pottery groups. Um, you know, we're quite lucky in pottery that we have this. Not all finds um, specialisms have guidelines, have um, professional standards and guidelines. It can be a bit more ad hoc. Um, they tend to rely on maybe key publications. So there may, can be slight issues there um, when you get your assessment reports in if you're not very clear on what you want in the first case. And I think Ian mentioned something about, just now about um, how you get your formatting and how you get your data back. You know, there's you know, quite a few organisations that I've worked for now will actually send their specialist the spreadsheet that they want them to fill in, um, which we're happy to do generally. Um, so the other thing is, because as specialists, we have to work within those parameters of what's expected of us from our peers and professionally. So when we're costing and we set these budgets, you know, we do need our project managers to trust us that we know what we're doing and we know the approach that we're taking is the most relevant because then as our budgets get cut, we can be flexible to a certain point, but we obviously still have to adhere to those standards. Um, and again, that comes back to early engagement and involving us in sampling strategies, particularly if you know or you start to find you've got a lot of material coming up, you know, we can determine the level of analysis. I mean, from a fine's point of view, I suppose it's different to Ruth, mm -hmm. in that, you know, we can see the material as it's coming in. We don't need to process samples to see what we've got. So before we start the assessment stage, you know, we have a good idea of the approach that we think would be a good one to take. Um, that's if you're working in-house. Obviously, it's different if you're a freelancer and you know nothing about it till you get a phone call and it needs to be done straight away. Um, what you don't want to do as a specialist, as I've said, is to create um, data sets which will then be replicated during analysis. Nobody wants that. Um, you want to avoid double handling. And uh, when those problems occur, it's often due to miscommunication or poor timetabling. Um, and project delays happen. One way, I keep saying it, don't I, is to engage your specialists early. Um, communicate with us about the project. Apart from anything else that's been said earlier, there aren't very many of us. You want to know that your specialists are going to be free to work on your project when you need them to. Um, 
you know, you want to minimise disruption to the project team, and as a specialist, one of the most frustrating things is, and this does happen in house less so than when you're a freelancer, is if one specialist does your assessment, and then later down the line, because of timetabling problems and full work programmes, you have another specialist doing your analysis. Uh, again, you know, we can contribute to the costs and helping with estimating resources, um, and in this. <laughs> The allocation of existing funds, you know, we are dependent on the quality and expertise of our project managers as well when it comes to this. Because what we don't want to do is if there's restrictions on the budget, and we've heard lots about budgets today, about going back and asking for more money after the assessment stage, when in reality it being a fixed price and there is no more money, what you don't want to do is have your specialists having to compete against each other within a, within a fixed budget as to, you know, what's more important. Moving on to Ruth. <laughs> okay, um, where I think the environmental archaeologists differ massively from the finds specialists is that we can't see what's coming out. We just can't see what's coming out of the ground until we actually get it under the microscope. And this is a really important thing. I think I, you can't really see it very well, but here I am with my microscope and a little little row of bags of flots. Um, and I know it is a really time-consuming part of assessment, getting the environmental assessment done. However, an environmental assessment can be an incredibly vi um, valuable thing, and it was really good to hear Ian's example just now. By bringing the different lines of um, really specialist environmental data together early on, it added considerable value to the project at that assessment stage. And I think that's the thing that I would really stress. So I've noted on here that an assessment can be enough, actually, to characterise a deposit type or an activity area. For example, sewage, we always hear about, oh yeah, this is a cesspit, this is a cesspit. Often it isn't a cesspit, and I can tell you that it's not a cesspit or it is a cesspit fairly quickly. Um, or it could be stable waste, and stable waste I would identify by looking at lots of different uh, strands of environmental archaeology, it'd be insects, mollusks, could go into that plant remains into that, types of plant remains, I can tell you all of that at assessment stage without doing a detailed quantification and it may well be that I don't then need to do an analysis stage of that sample. Um, in a butchery, furnace waste, midden waste, malting waste, these sort of things. So we are actually adding value at the assessment stage and quite often saving you money because then we don't need to repeat all of that information later on, um, particularly if all the specialists are allowed to speak to each other, and I think that's a really key thing. Um, I just, oh, that should come up. Um, it really doesn't show up at all, but here I've got a, a sample of actually a very good assemblage, a very good sample, an archibotanical sample. It's got bits of charcoal in it, it's got bits of grain in it, but I just wanted to show that to make the point that even a sample like that, I have to actually look at it. I can say, yeah, there's grain in it, there's charcoal in it, but I can't tell you what grain it is. If I look under the microscope, I can usually tell you what sort of phase it's from. I can tell you cultural, you know, some sort of cultural feedback about the site, all sorts of things. I also get boxes and boxes and boxes of samples that look like this that make my heart sink. And it actually makes my chest hurt assessing these things. I hate them. Full of roots, very, very little in it. It's pointless me sitting there and searching through every single sample. However, I cannot decide, I cannot look at the box and say, yeah, these samples are no use, these are. If I have the information up front about what the research aims are, um, what other materials come out from this site, what sort of artefacts come out from this site, what the activity areas are, um, and if I can go out on the site and see the samples coming out from the ground, I can often prioritise really quite efficiently. Um, and also it's great to hear from me in examples of things like pollen being looked at and mollusks being looked at, all, these, all this material that comes out in a column or a, um, you know, a core where you're looking at a time depth um, sequence, we, I, I would say always worth assessing at an early stage, but you just don't need to assess the whole lot. It might be you assess one from the top, the middle and the bottom, uh, but two or three points, but it's worth doing that. And there's just no way you can tell what's in that sample until you have done an assessment, but there are ways around it. So looking at, you know, cores, big spreads, things like that, we can do it. Um, and the last point on there is avoid repetition, which you've already heard from Kate. There's no point me saying, yeah, um, you know, this sample is really rubbish, there's not much in it. And then later on, there's the project manager saying to me, can you go back and see if there's anything worth dating in such and such a sample? So my approach will have to be varied depending on the site. This particular rooty mass is from a late 
Neolithic, um, uh, what's the word I want, um, sort of ritualised landscape. It's actually really important that I start to look for material to date. And if I found that material, I would probably hoik it out in the sample as I go along and keep it in a little tube to one side. I don't need to count it again. I've done that. I don't really want to go back delving in the bag, but at least I've got that material. It'd be completely different, obviously, for something where I've got lots and lots of material. Okay. Um, so that's the sort of cataloguing side of things. And then we really wanted to talk on um, reporting, and this is where I get my Clint Eastwood um, shot in. Um, so the good, a good assessment report, you know a good assessment report when you read one, it's engaging, they've prioritised, they've set you know, an interesting, engaging summary, you can see it. I don't want, I don't have to read through tables and tables and tables of data, it's really dull. Keep that data <coughs> for your archive and for your specialist. Don't, for God's sake, send that all to the um, manager. They just want to see a quick summary. Um, a really good example that I read recently, it's actually uh, my current um, trainee placement student who's working with me at the moment. She had worked for quite a few years in Quebec in Canada beforehand, and she did a lot of work looking at <coughs> colonial settlements in Quebec City, beautiful waterlogged preservation. She would have to... Um, produce detailed assessment reports but the clients didn't want obviously they didn't want to see a breakdown of which samples are going to be productive what they wanted to know is what she was going to be able to tell them what was worth doing what she could tell them so she broke it down into if you look at if you want if you are interested in um, pathways to deposition or whatever or if you are interested in feeding the city feeding the colony this is what you need to do and this is what i recommend we could also answer this question and this will be an additional response or additional um, resource probably worth doing but not necessary or this is the area that there's no point you spending the money now but we can keep that for a later date or we can keep that for a research project for somebody else okay um and the bad so this is my bad um when I, was, when I was quite long in experience, I worked on, well, not that experience, but um, I worked on a, an urban site, Roman site. I was getting, I just really felt that the, the project manager wasn't going to, um, wasn't liking the idea that I wanted to spend lots of money on my work. I did have actually great samples, but I was over-enthusiastic with my identification, and then, lo, the, there was Roman Pepper in a Britannia article, and it was just horrendous, and it then turned out to be a hawthorn seed. So, you know... Never, ever, ever put the you know, hot finds, even though you're really excited about it, into the press. Keep it to yourself until you check, double check it. That didn't belong in an assessment report, basically, and I should have kept that one to myself. I had other exciting stuff. It was a great set of samples, but you know the focus was all wrong, and I over-egged it, and then I was the one who ended up looking ridiculous. Um, so that's the that's I've got one to add the bad. To oh, yeah, we've got. I was going to say I've got one to add to the bad as well. One thing I didn't mention earlier when I was talking about um, the ceramics approach is um, we've done so many different versions um, of assessment reports. Everything from a basic scan we were talking about earlier with Paul about doing a basic scan on the site and providing spot dating to full analysis at assessment stage. And um, what you want to try and make sure you don't do is do something so vague, particularly if you've got a very large assemblage and you're quite daunted by it, you think, well, I'll just do something really, really basic at assessment stage and we'll deal with it for analysis. Something so <coughs> that you can't actually formulate those research questions and it doesn't actually give you anything useful for your assessment. It kind of defeats the, the object. Similarly, when you've got a small site coming in, you know, there's no, no reason why you can't just do your full analysis and provide an assessment mm -hmm. text at that point. Um, and increasingly, I find I'm being asked to do that. Um, and you know it, it's it's a good way to do it. It you know you can deal with it all there. You know what you've got, and you can just go back to the analysis and, and tidy up the loose ends. Um, in terms of the ugly um, things you don't want, and which you know you do still see, is when you get um, an assessment report, and um, you know there may be specialist reports missing, or you might have. Um, you can see that the specialist reports have been done by somebody who isn't familiar with that region, with that area, and that can actually you know, have serious implications. Um, or whether specialist reports haven't been fully integrated into an executive summary, and the conclusions bear um, little relation to what the specialists are saying. You know, it's that whole quality assurance. Mm -hmm. It's making sure that you know you have somebody 
especially when you have so many bits being done by different specialists. The person who is pulling it all together actually knows and understands what they're what they're pulling together, really. Yeah. So summary. Yeah, which does bring us on to the yeah. summary, really. <laughs> so quick wrap is. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so the three really main points that I think we're doing with an assessment from a specialist point of view and obviously from the archaeological point of view as well, really, uh, we are cataloguing. We are um, providing a summary for the report. The detail can st sit in the specialist um, database or in the site database. We don't need to present that in a report. We're identifying the research potential. We need to link that back to the PD or the WSI. We need to think about academic and educational potential for the future because we have to be relevant, really. I, I think we need to still think, as a specialist, I was so bored of producing, you know, report after report after report about the same old things. And I can tell you, a Roman site's going to produce spelt wheat. You don't care. I don't care really anymore. But I might be seeing stuff that is interesting from an academic research point of view. And that's what interests me. That's probably, you know, me interest you. Maybe I don't need to do it for the analysis, for the, the you know, the particularly costed project but it keeps me sane and uh, keeps most specialists sane and it just makes it more interesting. So adding um, added value really, I think is what we need to start thinking about. Um, and we get that research potential, really we have to work within frameworks, there's no use being isolated, we have to uh, work within a network for each project, but also our own specialist networks. And we have to think ahead when we're doing costing, very important. I It drives me mad when I hear from archaeobotanists saying, Mm, we got these samples, I really wish we could date them, but there's no money left. If there's potential to date, be brave, say, actually, I think we should be dating some of this material for the sake of the material, not just for dating the archaeology. Um, but put that in, raise that at an early stage, raise it at an assessment stage, be relevant, value added, and most important of all, dialogue. So dialogue within your project team really important it just adds all that value rather than having all these disjointed dull specialist reports when they all come together that's when you get the interesting um story and that's that's it all thank you very much.